Uh, thank you very much indeed. I was really delighted to be asked uh, to do this. Um, and it's a joy to come back to London. Um, this is kind of an interesting talk for me. I'm going to be brief, but um, one of the things that I feel in retrospect is, why is it so difficult? Hep C, we have these drugs, they cure people. Why does it seem like such a struggle? Maybe it doesn't to, to all of you, but in retrospect, it does to me. And I mean, I fell into Hep C. I mean, literally, uh, quite a lot of you know this story, but just for the, the, the few that, that don't, what happened was, um, in 1999, um, I, I already had cirrhosis by that point, and um, I had three people that I knew a little bit, and we all got together uh, at something completely unrelated, and we're talking about our hep C, and we all moaned, uh, as good people with hep C sometimes do, um, about the fact at that time that we couldn't find decent support or information that we felt we could trust. And I'd, got, I'd found one support group, and I'd gone to it, and um, everybody there was using heroin, and half the people were actually nodding out. So it didn't feel very supportive. And um, the information I was... When I discovered I had cirrhosis, the, the first thing I found on the internet was a thing saying that hepatitis C was the... Um, uh, I think it was the, the most common cause of death from infectious diseases in Australia. And so I immediately thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. And so anyway, we got together and, and we were talking and the idea came up that, that maybe we should do something for people with hep C. Because at the time, there were over 500 charities registered in the UK for HIV and not a single one for hep C. And so we decided we would do that. And I had this idea in the back of my mind that I might be a trustee of this organization, possibly turn up for maybe, say, four meetings a, uh, a year, and that would be that. And then one day, while we were going through the legal procedure of setting up a charity, the other three got me in a corner on one of my weak moments and said, we're all very busy, you're going to have to run it. And I was, well, wait a minute, I, I have no experience in any of these uh, areas that would be useful. Um, and, you know, I've never, never worked in the charity sector at all. Anyway, I ended up doing it because I, I didn't, I was at a point in my life where I didn't really know where I wanted to go. Um, in some respects, I was quite lost just at that moment. And so I started doing this. So it was very much sort of on the job uh, learning. And, you know, then it became something that, I suddenly realized I cared about so much, that I cared about people with hepatitis C, and particularly those who didn't have a voice. And we still don't have as much of a voice as we should, but things are a lot better. And so we started with a website. And so I spent two years writing the most comprehensive website that I could imagine, really. Um, and then we moved into support. And then, of course, it became very clear that actually there was no voice for people with hepatitis C. And what people needed desperately was, a, was that voice. And so we got into representation. And the idea of the Hep C Trust at the beginning was that this should be for everyone with hepatitis C. It shouldn't be for, for people who got it through injecting. It shouldn't be for people who got it through blood transfusions. It shouldn't be got from people who got it healthcare systems abroad. It should be for everyone. And that people with hep C were just this group of people, however disparate. Um, and over the years, it's, it's, there have been accusations at the Trust that we didn't look after this group or we didn't look after that group and so on. But actually, we've really tried to look after everyone. And at the center of it has been this idea that people with the lived experience of, of hepatitis C are incredibly important. And I had a rule at one point that I would only employ people like that. And then, of course, that became incredibly restrictive and so was dropped. But it's still the ethos underneath the trust. And one of the things that I'm most delighted about is the role of peers has become so central to the hepatitis C response in the UK. But also that 
the hepatitis C trust has been accepted as this organization that has to be involved at all levels of the response. Because very often patient groups are seen as a kind of, well, we ought to do something. We ought to say, well, we'll probably invite them along. Let's just hope they don't say too much. And, um, you know, really to be an organization that is a partner with all the other organizations represented here. Um, and I think that, that, you know, I guess awareness, which is one of the things we've been talking about here, is one of the critical issues. And it's not just in the UK. The big problem with hepatitis C worldwide is that not enough people are diagnosed. And it's a really, really difficult issue as to how you do this. And um, we've just done some workshops on, on trying to find the, the people who were infected many, many years ago, and for one reason or another, no longer think of themselves as, as drug users, for example, or no longer think about the risk factors that exposed them to hepatitis C. It might have been a blood transfusion years ago. And how you get to those people. And I have become, over the years, a real convert to the idea of screening. And that we shouldn't be thinking, well, should we do screening? Oh, it's got to go through the, um, you know, the screening committee. It's, you know, is it cost-effective? And so on. It's just about how do you make it cost-effective, not is it cost-effective. And I'm delighted that we have effectively, although it's still not working as well as it should, screening in, in drug services and in prisons. But we need to do more of it. And it's been talked about a couple of times here, putting it onto the, the health check. Um, we've been trying to get this done for seven years, I think, eight years. Uh, we first proposed it. And it's because with the, the, the cost of the, the drugs coming down so much, you really can spend a certain amount of money on testing, and it's still going to be cost effective. I think that one of the, the, the things I feel I really failed about was getting uh, celebrities involved. We had for a moment Anita Roddick, who was absolutely perfect in many respects um, in terms of destigmatizing it, you know, just. A, a working mother, if you like, um, and but uh, and and she committed to giving us as much time as we wanted. But you know, she really unfortunately died six months after saying, "I'm happy to uh, come and give you my time." And it's always been like that with hepatitis C. It's felt to me: you think you've got something, you take a couple of steps forward, and then there's a step back. And it's felt to me like pushing this enormous boulder, and I don't mean on my own, I mean with all of you, up this hill. And I kept thinking, we're going to get to the top and it'll have enough momentum, it'll roll down of its own accord. And we're not there yet. And I'm, I'm in many respects, wish to apologize that I bailed out and went to live abroad uh, five months ago, leaving you still pushing this boulder up the hill. Um, but we will get to the point, and I truly think that this is doable. And we're beginning to see internationally more and more countries going, yes, we want to do elimination. And it is a lot of hard work. It really is. But I would be really devastated if we don't manage to do this by 2030. And when you're, when you're thinking about, you know, that's why I say, why is it so hard? You know, when you're thinking health generally and you have this area where we have a cure for a disease that kills people through cirrhosis, through liver cancer, and we don't do it, it's just insane. I think um, the, the drugs got through NICE at their sort of lift price, more or less, as being cost effective. You know, now they are significantly cost saving. And if you want to rationally um, allocate resources in a health system, what you would do is allocate all the money, increase it to, to all the things that are cost saving first before you move on to anything else. And yet, you know, we've had such a struggle here. The rationing that was introduced by NHS England was, I felt, really just appalling. And the rationing was introduced, in my view, because NHS felt that people with hepatitis C would not complain about it, that they could get away with it with hepatitis C. In other words, you pick a disadvantaged group 
and you disadvantage them further on the grounds that they're already so disadvantaged they won't complain about it. I mean, that's not really the health system one wants. I think things are a lot better now and it's obviously turned around and we of course run out of people to, to treat and that is, as I said, the big issue. Can we find them? And it's going to be up to you to do it in the next few years. But I, um, I kind of, in my personal experience, when I look back, largely I did what I did because I was too stupid to see what the obstacles were. If I'd right at the beginning seen all the obstacles, I wouldn't have done it. In fact, when I, I knew so little about Hep C when I started the Hep C Trust that I literally thought, oh, this will probably take, what, four or five years, and then I can go and get a proper job? So it really helps to have that kind of slightly blinkered view and take the next step you have to do and persevere. And then I think we'll get there. And just to... to, to end by saying there are interestingly some because what I do now is we look at possible drugs in the future and what they might bring and there's some discussions at the moment about long-acting injectables for hep C and I don't know whether they'll arrive in time I'd like to think you'll have sorted it all before they're necessary but it is something that they're looking at where you might be able to give someone one shot and that's all. Uh, there are obviously lots and lots of challenges because you don't want to give somebody a shot of something that then has a, a, an interaction with something else that they're taking when you can't undo the shot you've given them. But it looks like this, this might be possible. So that's kind of hopeful. And I'd really like to just leave you with a thanks for what a joy it's been to work with all of you, to be, have been very intimately involved with the London Joint Working Group. And it's really great that this is the fifth conference and it's so well attended. I think it must be at least 50% more than last year. So, um, and of course, I, I'm sorry that, um, that this year there was no demonstration at the beginning to liven things. But thank you very much indeed.